So good evening and warm welcome to all attending our webinar tonight. This is the first in what will be a, a mini series where we are aiming to provide uh, CPD through the sharing of skills with our members. Our aim is to keep these uh, fairly short and sweet but informative. For those that don't know, ICON is the British Institute of Conservation, which is the professional body for conservators in the UK, offering professional accreditation in the industry and also advocacy. ICON Stained Glass Group is a volunteer run group which focuses on putting on events for members who are interested in or practice stained glass conservation. We encourage anyone taking part this evening to join our group in order to enjoy your participating in future events and also to add your voice to the community. If you're not yet a member of ICON, please do keep in mind that this series of webinars and other events are free to members. You can join ICON in a few easy steps through the website. We've been delighted with the ticket sales for this event tonight, which is our first virtual offering. And I hope that our future webinars will continue to spark such enthusiasm with you all. Um, keep an eye on ICON's iConnect emails and our social media channels to be kept informed of any upcoming activities. And also do please get in touch if you have a burning desire to give a presentation of your own. So on to this evening's presentations, which have been pre-recorded to mitigate against any internet dropouts. During each of the presentations, you're invited to put questions to any of our speakers who will be joining us live later to answer any, anything, any queries you might have. Uh, to do so, you should type your question into the box, which is at the bottom of the screen in the, in the chat box. Uh, Zoe and Charlotte, uh, my colleagues, will uh, collate these questions um, for our speakers to then answer. So this evening, we have two presentations from established European conservators. Both work at Glassmalerei Peters in Paderborn in Germany. The first presentation is from Marcus Kleiner, ACR, who is the head of conservation at Peters and has worked for the company for the last 18 years. With a bachelor's in glass painting, Marcus went on to study historical heritage at the University of Hildesheim and then obtained his PhD in conservation science at the University of Bamberg. He became an ICON accredited conservator last year. Marcus will be presenting on the reconstruction of 19th century windows in St. Gertrude's, just north of Brussels, um, in Belgium, which were badly damaged in World War II. In 2010, the architect decided to reconstruct the windows using artistic infills where the original glass was missing. Our second speaker is Christa Heydrich, who has worked for Glass Mallory Peters for the last 16 years, during which she completed her MA in Conservation and Restoration at the University of Applied Sciences in Erfurt. Krista is in charge of both conservation and also the creation of new work for French-speaking projects. Krista will be presenting on Peters' research using realkalization techniques used in building conservation, which is used to serve corral corroded dial de Vere windows in situ. So without further ado, let's go to the presentations. Hello and a warm welcome from my side. Today I want to speak about a very interesting conservation and reconstruction project we have done last year. Reconstruction of 19th century stained glass windows with artistic infills. The church St. Gertrude's is placed in Machland near Brussels. In World War II, the windows of the church became damaged very hard. In 1949, they decided to deinstall the broken glass and store them. The situation in moment was like that. Choir windows got conservated and placed back behind protective glazing. The windows in the North Choir and South Choir, also two transept windows, are empty. Because it was too much work to them to find out the right windows out of this pile of broken glass. In 2001, Aletta Rambeau and Libyan Lambeau started mapping and sort the glass by different windows. The most of the panels become assigned by them to the different windows. 
two apostol windows and two ornamental windows in the north and south choir was nearly complete. The transept windows from the atelier Comeré Caponnier had still a lot of gaps. In 2010, the architect Giselle Ganton got commissioned for conservation and reconstruction of the transept windows. She instructed the artist Peter Schultzen to develop a design concept for reconstruction of the windows, including the old fragments. He placed the existing fragments to its old place and designed infills with different kind of types. Scholzen took scriptural text fitting to the stained glass scene. So the glass linked the windows and the text linked the broken scene. In 2020, Glasmaler Peters got instructed to realize the work of Peter Schultzen and do the conservation work of the historic stained glass. In the beginning, there was much discussion about possibilities in glass and technique for realizing the infills. Samples was made in different kind of glass, painting techniques and sandblasting. Also, the thickness of the glass and working on both sides was used for design effects for the infills. Also, the coloring of the glass was important. The color has to fit with the basic color of the original panels, and also the color is symbolic for the scene. For example, the south windows is yellow for envy and treason because the scene shows the adulteress. The other phase of this project was the conservation of the existing original pieces. The first step was the documentation of the state as well as different cleaning tests. There was a lot of different kind of dirt on the surface because of storing the glass not professional. Then we have to start puzzle and find out the small pieces of original glass for the gaps. For the rest of the missing pieces, a design is print out and placing the originals to its original positions. After that, we have cutting the infills out of blue, flashed and white antique glass. Then the infill become covered by foam for the paintwork. The pieces became airbrushed with different kind of colors Fired in the kiln and get sand blasted. After designing the infills, the old and the new glass become laddered to fit old and new glass together. After that, we do a step by step installation in our tower to discuss again the result of the windows with the architect and the artist. The result closed the gaps in every little detail and complements the original without being too present for the viewer. The basic color of the windows gives the viewer the impression of the complete windows. The scriptural text builds the bridges between the gaps. The use of antique glass gives the right structure between old and new. Reconstructive without being full reconstructive it increases the value of the original. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thanks a lot to the ICON team for the organization and help. Hope we see us well and healthy. Dear audience, thank you very much for joining us tonight. In the following presentation, I invite you to share a conservative technique we newly tested on concrete glazing in collaboration with the BAM laboratory in Berlin. Given more time, breaking new ground to conserve concrete glazing in situ. Since the 1920s, dalle de verre, or so-called concrete glazing, appeared and had its most popular time after Second World War. Many monuments today contain concrete glazing all across Europe and Northern America. In many cases, the concrete glazing forms large areas of the surface of the entire building. Sometimes almost the building is constructed of concrete glazing. Today, several decades, in some cases a century later, we are facing the degradation and subsequently the problems about their degradation. The composition of concrete, iron reinforcement and glass may show up today in different degree of degradation. I think every of you knows such condition. The increased volume of the reinforcement up to two and a half times due to corrosion cause cracks in concrete and glass and may even cause the loss of those. The proprietors, responsible persons and at least the conservators fear these cases as the necessary interventions are heavy in costs and weight. And sometimes only partial reconstruction can be done. What we as a conservator prefer is an intervention in good time before the degradation process achieves a point of very poor condition of the artwork. Here, a brief list of possible conservative treatments available for concrete glazing. All these techniques have originally been developed for the need of aged concrete buildings and further they have been tested on concrete glazing, just as we did for the realkalization with the BAM laboratory. But before getting deeper into the process of the realkalization, we need to understand what happens to the concrete made objects getting old. Young, fresh concrete, which is composed in the simplest case of concrete, water and grain, forms calcium hydroxide. And this calcium hydroxide is highly alkaline with its pH value of 12. This alkalinity passivates the reinforcement. That means it has a protective effect on it. The concrete protects the reinforcement of corrosion. This protective skill can easily be visualized by using phenolphthalein solution. The alkaline areas with a pH value between 9 and 14 appear pinky and here the concrete still is sane and protects the iron from corrosion. Under the influence of temperature, carbon dioxide and humidity the carbonization of the concrete begins. Carbonization means a chemical reaction which loans the alkalinity of the concrete from the outside inwards. Under the influence of carbon dioxide, the calcium hydroxide transforms to calcium carbonate. On one hand, this has a positive effect of increasing the strength of the concrete, but on the other hand it decreases the pH value down to 9. The decrease of pH value means the loss of alkalinity, which means, means the loss of protection of the reinforcement from corrosion by the concrete. All these reactions depend on the porosity, the quality, the exposure, and the atmospheric circumstances of the object. Once the porous concrete decreases its value below 9, 
the corrosion of the reinforcement with all its well-known effects will start. Just as a little visualization of this reaction, here a comparative result after application of phenolphthalein solution on a carbonated concrete. The electrochemical realkalization only can be applied to aged but not yet heavily damaged concrete glazing. This technique has to be applied at time, before the corrosion of the reinforcement occurs. We might say electrochemical realkalization needs to be done at the point of lowered alkalinity before its complete loss. But how to find out at what point the object is? A first hint can be the absence of cracks in the concrete wider than 2 mm. The very obviously obvious co corrosive effects of surrounding framework are no obstacle of realkalization. All these are examples of concrete glazing showing effects of age and damage. But these examples were not yet at the point of larger cracks or loss of material. In such cases, obviously the volume of the reinforcement did not yet increase due to corrosion. But before the application of electrochemical realkalization, we need to know exactly at what point our object is. Therefore, we could do a test using phenolphthalein, but this method is destructive. A less destructive way of investigation is the potential field measurement. We need a point of connection to the reinforcement to do the measurement. The entire panel needs to be soaken up with water before testing with a multimeter along the run of the reinforcement. The run of the reinforcement could be shown using X-ray, as here shown to visualize, but to be honest, this is not workable in reality and at least not on site. But your experience will let you know where to search for the reinforcement. In the range of minus 150 to minus 200 millivolt, electrochemical realkalization is possible. Above this value, the concrete still got its alkalinity. Below minus 200 millivolt, realkalization will, won't work out anymore. Then the panel's outer surface has to be covered entirely with compresses. A sacrificial auxiliary anode is placed, covering again the entire surface to be treated. Another layer of compresses covers the anode. And it is soaken with an electrolyte solution. Finally, a DC power source is connected about 7 to 14 days, 8 hours per day. Under the applied electrical current, electroosmosis, diffusion and capillary absorption will happen. Negatively charged ions as hydroxide, chloride ions and carbonate ions migrate, migrate towards the anode and positively charged ions as sodium ions migrate inwards until maintaining electrical neutrality. This achieved balanced condition after the electrochemical realkalization with a pH above 12 or 13 means the re-establishment of alkaline passivity. To show you a little more pleasant what happens, here again the effect to the concrete. The concrete is aged and carbonization took place, alkalinity heavily decreased. The anode, compresses and current are set and the repassivation starts. The effect goes further. 
after a period of seven to fourteen days the repassivation is done and the reinforcement may benefit again of the alkaline passivation of the concrete. A destructive test would show now a, such a result. Using the contact point to the reinforcement applied to connect the current and the wet condition of the object, a potential field measurement could easily be done again to show the achieved range about above minus 150 millivolt. After having taken off the compressors and the anode, a thin whitish layer will show up on the surface of the entire panel. This material is sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is what you can use at home cleaning burns from dishes, for example. It is highly solub soluble in water and will easily be cleaned off using water. The connection point to the reinforcement has to be undone and the concrete to be filled in in this area. As a result, the concrete glazing panel will look the same as it did before the treatment. On the left side, you see the concrete glazing before the treatment and on the right side, after the electrochemical realkalization. All the other steps like reprofiling and cleaning the surface, gluing or even changing glasses need to be done before the electrochemical realkalization. To sum up the method, first, by measuring the potential field, the state of carbonation has to be captured. In the following, a decision can be taken whether an electrochemical realkalization might be done or not. All actions to the concrete glazing as reprofiling the concrete, repair of glass, etc. need to be done before. Then an electrical contact to the reinforcement needs to be established. The compressors and the anode need to be applied and circled with the electrolyte solution and then the current is set. The entire treatment needs up to 14 days being applied 8 hours a day. This asks for punctually control of the treatment. Is the current okay? Is the humidity of the compressors right? The state of the humidity of the compressors depends a lot on the weather, but also on the porosity of the concrete. As advantages, I may say that this method restores the lost alkalinity to the carbonated concrete without changing its visual properties. The entire original material is kept and for a long period in future no further corrosion will affect to the concrete glazing. The electrochemical realkalization could be considered as a sort of lifetime extension. Of course everything has two sides. The intervention, intervention is very watery. This needs to be considered. Are there objects inside of the building sensitive to humidity? Is there enough water and current available on site? The pores will decrease in size and this is not reversible. But the investigation showed that the electrochemical realkalization is applicable, applicable several times. Further, a coating adapted to the concrete's necessities could be intended additionally. And of course, a long-term surveillance is evident. If men cannot bath in a fountain of use, wouldn't it be nice for concrete glazing at least? Even if the effect won't last forever, it will give some more time to the concrete glazing. Thank you very much for your interest and stay healthy. Thank you, Marcus and Krista, uh, for your really interesting presentations. Um, now uh, we're going to go to the questions. So if you'd both like to uh, turn on your cameras and unmute, please.
and that'll be good so the audience can see you. The host is there. Yeah, the host stopped the video. Okay, um, Krista and Marcus, did you want to turn on your videos? That's it. Hi. Hello. <coughs> Hello. 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 Welcome back. Um, so, uh, we'll go, uh, Marcus, to you first. We've got a question here from Fernando. Um, just waiting for that to come through. Okay, we're still waiting for that to come through. So I've got a question for you, for you first, Marcus. Um, so, and that is, uh, what did the parish think of your conservation solution? It, it's it's a very uh, different aesthetic to what they they might traditionally be used to. So, how did the parish accept or not the uh, solution? Hi, Fernando. Um, I, I, at the moment, I don't know what the parish thinks about this because the, the windows are not installed at the moment. Um, end of this uh, month, we do the installation and then the, they will see it. Okay. At the moment, only the artist and, yeah, but I think it will be accepted because the designs was uh, spoken with the parish. So I think and I hope they will love it. <laughs> Um, how legible is the text from ground level? Uh, it's it's possible to read it, um, but not in all details, cause the, uh, the the types overlapping a little bit, and it's uh, written from from outside and inside, so that is have an own structure and. Um, you, you can read it from both sides if you want to, but you have to go very close to them and that's uh, not possible. The idea is to read it because um, the, well, like, like I've said, the scene is also um, uh, compatible with text there. Yeah? So um, if you see the adulteress, then this is also the text about the adulteress. Out of survival. Okay, thank you. Um, Fernando, I think you have a question if you want to unmute. Hi Mary, uh, well I did you, just, you just read my question really. Um, yeah, basically I just wanted to congratulate uh, Marcus and the whole team from Class Malaga Basis for such fantastic uh, uh, approach to conservation. I think it's really daring. I think they go one more time, one step ahead from what is um, is normally done in in the rest of the countries, really. And I think it uh, takes uh, courage and it's quite brave, really, to do something like this. So my question basically was like, you just read it for me. Thanks a lot. Yeah. But yeah, the, the reaction from the locals basically, but thanks. Thanks a lot, Mary. Yeah. And congratulations again, Marcus. Thank you. Okay. Krista, I have a, I have a question for you. Uh, just, just while we're waiting to see if we have any more. Um, the conservation of Daldevere is obviously extremely challenging. It's obviously a very um, experimental, difficult material materials to be working with. Um, it's very heavy. It's difficult to remove and bring to a studio. So what you what you sort of developed is obviously a very good solution for in situ um, conservation. Um, could you talk a bit about how expensive this technique is, though? No, to be honest, um, it is quite it is quite recent that we finished uh, the tests and that we uh, that we finished the test with the laboratory and that we did um, the test the first test on site. Um, so no, I I can't already evaluate uh, the prices. I guess this I hope I hope there will be projects there will be owners 
um, with the uh, mood, with mood, um, uh, having, having, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm missing words, um, who want to be the first to try it out on their objects. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and then we will know better. Okay, um, just a sort of extension of that, which we've just had a question come through, which is to say um, that the, the setup costs we imagine would be quite expensive for a conservation studio. Um, no, not really, to be honest. No? No, you need, what you need is, um, is um, the equipment to do the uh, potential field measurement. Um, this is a sort of, it's called multimeter. This is not expensive. And then you need, uh, you, you need to apply the current and uh, b before you, you need to apply uh, your, your soaking material on the, on the entire surface, it's how the stone conservators do when they, when they want to make dripping in uh, a liquid into a stone object. So these are all uh, materials and, and uh, techniques existing and they are not expensive, no. But we, we don't have yet enough um, experience about the application on site, uh, in reality, on, on, a, on a whole object, and what, what will happen on summertime if it's very hot? Do we, have to need, uh, do we have to need people being around all the time? Or does, is it, so, because this will affect a lot to the price, or is it enough if, uh, if one uh, goes there every two days? And all these experiences uh, we don't already have. Okay, um, but another question come through for you again, Krista. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so it's, can you suggest what sort of additional lifespan might be expected? Uh, um, realizing that there's different environmental conditions in different places. Yes, <clears throat> so um, beside the uh, different conditions on site, or around the object, you have different um, conditions in the material of the object. You have different uh, composition of, uh, of the concrete, you have different porosities, and all this affects a lot of, uh, to the speed of uh, loss of alkalinity again. Um, it is a question I, I asked uh, several times to the laboratory because <laughs> conservators want to know such things, but um, the, uh, scientific, the scientists um, answer that you can almost say that you will prolongate the life of the object um, as long as it has already older, um, you know? So if it has been done, uh, 1950 and you do the realkalization today you will gain more or less the same time again but this has to be this has to be uh, uh, this has to be um, followed with a long time um, how, how do you say mapping no if, if, you, if you look if you, if you come all five years to see the object yes. Yeah. And uh, do you plan to do that at specific locations once you've identified good examples or what's, what, what's the next steps for you in this, in this research? The next step would be to have uh, an object to apply. We are considering, we are in, in discussion with, uh, with owners of, uh, of objects, but it's not yet fixed. Okay as it is, it is really quite recent. We just, we just finished uh, this project in the beginning of this year. Okay. Uh, Krista, I'm afraid uh, you're no longer gonna be able to have a break again because there's another question for you. <laughs> so uh, this one is, uh, how large of an area can be realkalized at any one time? Uh, there are some uh, Delta Bear windows with large uh, expanses uh, and, um, Maria was wondering um, if that would have to be done bit by bit or all at once. Uh, it can be done all at once, yes. But what you, what you need is a, is a point of uh, contact to each, um, to each circle of 
of reinforcement. So if you have 50 panels, one beside another, and each panel has a, has a circle of uh, reinforcement, you need to connect to each circle of reinforcement, but you could deal, do it in, in one time. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, Marcus, it's, it's your turn. <laughs> um, this is a very simple question. Uh, but how did you pick the fonts for the infills? Is it uh, a typical Bible print or font uh, from the period the windows were originally made? Or was it something more contemporary? Can you say again? It stopped uh, a little bit here. Sorry. How did you choose the font that was used for the, for the text? The font style was it a particular font that had a, a particular association with those windows the, and, and date the date the, the fonts was chosen well, uh, the fonts was chosen by the uh, by the uh, artist uh, was different kinds i, I remember it was um, times and um, an arial or something um, a different kind of fonts because this was also a little bit of texture so you have fonts with series and without series so really straight and um, but this was all chosen by the by the artist he's played with that okay uh krista we we're going back to you again uh, we have a question which is if carbonization strengthens the concrete, does realkalization weaken the concrete? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, I guess this would be a good question to, to ask our scientific partners, um, uh, which whom we did this uh, project. Uh, it is a good question, and I don't know why I didn't already ask it. Um, but the strength. So the really physical strength is a good result of the carbonization, but we don't need it. So I wouldn't even be afraid of weakening the concrete to a point as it had been before when it was made. Um, but we should we should uh, look up this point again with with uh, the people with whom we did the, the tests. Okay. Um, so thanks again to both of you. I think that's probably all the questions we have time for. Um, your work is really, really fascinating and very, very different to each other as the things that you've presented to us today. And we hope that you'll present to us again in the future. Uh, thank you for everybody who's attended this evening for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you all at our next events. Uh, so keep an eye on the Stained Glass Group's upcoming events page on the ICON website and also our social media channels for more information. Uh, for those of you who are not already an ICON member, please consider joining us. Uh, recently, ICON have developed their networking and support channels for the conservation community, which gives you, as a conservator, more opportunities to network, voice concerns, and shape the industry. As a member, you'll receive emails notifying you of jobs in conservation, news of upcoming events, and discounted, if not free, admission to events. You'll also receive ICON's magazine. And thanks again for everyone for attending. Special thanks as well to Charlotte Roden and Zoe Harrigan for all of their work behind the scenes in making this event happen. And again, thanks to Krista and to Marcus. And we hope to see everybody again uh, very soon. So thank you and good night. <laughs>